Uh, this is um, the next installment in uh, the new series, Forever Free. And um, I'm not going in any particular order, but I do want to address subjects that are very, very appropriate. Jesus Christ said, um, he whom the Son sets free will be free indeed. And yet the fact of the matter is, is that a lot of people who name in the name of the Lord are not free. And they're trapped in all kinds of bondages and addictions and patterns of behavior. Um, most surveys indicate that people who uh, say go to church are really not that much different than their non-believing neighbors. And so we're persuaded of better things uh, concerning all of us. And we're looking to uh, deepen our experience in what it means to live free. And so I'm going to have a word of prayer. And then we're going to start this study tonight, which is on a very, very serious subject that I hope will really uh, build you up. So, Father, we're grateful to be here. I'm thankful for each person. And I'm grateful that you're in control of the universe and our country and our city and this property and all that we have and are uh, belongs to you and we pray that we could be used to bless these people now through your word in Christ's name amen, amen. so um, I'll just I'll just cut to the chase here it is five reasons to forgive that's what this message is we're going on five reasons to forgive and if you think that you have the right to hold on to something that someone has done to you I am going to surprise you by saying you do. You do have the right to hold on to the things that people have done to you. You have the right to try to get even. You have the right to try to um, um, even the score. You have the right to hold on to it in the belief that you're punishing them by not letting it go. All of those things are really bad plans, but you have the right to do that and nobody can tell you. What I'm going to challenge you tonight is not that that isn't your right. What I'm going to just challenge you about tonight is, is that that is a very, very damaging thing to do to yourself. And so um, five uh, reasons to forgive, and I want to start in... Um, if you have a Bible, you want to pass it out, or you want to look it up on your phone, I'm going to uh, reference the Bible tonight and talk uh, pretty practically about forgiveness and how it works. Here's the first reason of five reasons to forgive. Number one, because forgiveness ends offense. All right? Now, um, I've taught for a long time. I'll, let me read these scriptures first. Matthew 6, uh, 14 and 15 says... Come on, somebody say, what's it say? What's it, say? it says, Matthew 6, 14 and 15 says, For if you forgive others, this is Jesus speaking, if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. I mean, just think about that. I'm, I'm going to pick on someone. If you forgive your brother, your sister, another person, their trespasses against you. So your Father in heaven will forgive you. But if you do not forgive your brother, neither will your Father in heaven forgive you. Now that's not just one place in the Bible and it's not a misprint, I promise you. That is everywhere, stated over and over and over. For example, it says in Matthew 7, the same measure that you use will be used on you. How hard is it to offend you? So everybody's putting the experiences of life, let's say, through one of those colanders that your mother used to use when she was shaking down the spaghetti to get the water out, you know. How big are the holes at the bottom of your sieve? Are you like real precise and fine that almost nothing done against you can get through without you picking it up and deciding? Or are you a little more, yeah, a lot of stuff's running through there, I'm just letting it go by. I've suggested that these three uh, words, we can just put them all up, mercy, grace, and you, don't, you didn't get it? Okay, no problem, write these three words down. Um, mercy, uh, grace, and forgiveness. Now mercy, is a thing you don't do. Mercy is not giving people what they deserve. 
Now, how many people could be honest enough to say, I'm strong in knowing what people deserve, right? That guy that cut me off in traffic, that guy that cussed me out um, on the job site, that a person who hung up the phone on me, that, that family, I, I know, I know. And so mercy is not giving people what they deserve. Just do nothing. What should I do? How about nothing? Paul McCartney called and said, let it be. <laughs> right? <laughs> let it be. Let it be. Words of wisdom. Just leave it alone. That's mercy. I could do something. People would say I'm justified if I did. No one would say, I don't understand why you did that. Everyone would be like, I understand why you did that. But that doesn't make it okay, right? So there's mercy. Then there's grace. Grace is like graduate school compared to mercy. Grace is giving people what they don't deserve. So same person, victory level one was, I didn't do anything to him. Level two is, I actually showed grace to her. That's why Jesus said, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. The third thing is, so mercy is the start of it. I'm not going to do anything. Grace is next. I'm going to show some kindness where I certainly haven't received that. But the ultimate way to be free is forgiveness. Forgiveness ends the offense. Okay? So I want to take you to just one other passage of Scripture here. Um, a little uh, later, having trouble reading my own writing, uh, Jesus gives what came to be known as the Lord's Prayer. How many people think they could say the Lord's Prayer? Want to say the Lord's Prayer? So let's say it together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our as we, those who, against us, and lead us into temptation from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Now, Jesus taught this at uh, many places in the New Testament. But, um, of course, the, the importance in studying anything is to look for the context of it. And what actually is the context of the Lord's Prayer? And what you find out is, is that he had been teaching uh, the disciples about the dangers of religious ritual and the importance of sincerity before God. And what do you think was on his mind? Just think about the Lord's Prayer. Just think about how every single person in this room knew that. More people know the Lord's Prayer than know John 3.16. I mean, it is so widely known. And some people grew up in faith traditions where your minister would tell you, you know, go say the Lord's Prayer ten times. Or here's a necklace, you know, say it a beat at a time, you know, say it, 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 say it. And so people know it and they've heard it. What do you think was going through Jesus' mind after he said, what we just said? He taught them, pray like this. So then he said the prayer. What do you think was going through his mind? I mean, I can think of a lot of things. I hope they don't turn this into a ritual. Man, they're not even getting it at all. They're going to make this into a necklace. It, it isn't a prayer to be said over and over. It's a model prayer. It starts with worship. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. And then it has petition or asking, your kingdom come, which then parallel, your will be done on earth. Like Make, make earth like heaven. It's not, how's that going right now? And, and it's a great thing to pray. But the pattern is worship, petition, and then there's some confession. Forgive us our trespasses as what? But I mean, do you really want that? Is that what you want? Do you want God to forgive you the way you forgive others? God, let me just tell you, I'm setting the standard. If you forgive me as good as I forgive others, that's plenty for me. But there it is again, the Bible saying the same thing again. Forgive us our trespasses as we do it like I do it, God. Do it the same way I do it. Forgive people just as quickly. How quickly do you forgive? I got to wait a long time till I feel like doing it. Well, that's how God's going to forgive you. Well, we'll be in touch. <laughs> right? Not, not awesome, right? And so um, I'm going to give you a little definition um, about forgiveness because I want to be any uh, confusion about what we're talking about here. So here's a little uh, definition. Forgiveness is 
the decision to release a person from the obligation that resulted when they injured you. Now, I've taught that a lot of times through the years, and typically what I would do is I would, I would get something from somebody. I was, the last time I taught this, I used a box of chocolates that I took from my wife, but um, the, the basic thing is this. Who's got a wallet on them? Anybody got a wallet? Wallet, 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 wallet. Come on, chop, chop. Wallet. Thank you, thank you. You'll never see this again in this life. Because he's got dough in here too. So what if I give him back the money, but I, what if I give him back the wallet, but what do you want, the money or the wallet? If you had to choose. Wallet. Oh, good. Well, your wallet, my money. <laughs> now, this is such a practical little thing. Can you tell me your first name again? Larry. Larry. So this is such a practical little thing because um, Larry has to forgive me. Right? Didn't I just teach that? Yeah. So this is, this is really a great thing for me to be saying because now I got the money. <laughs> and he has to forgive me. What if I went and said to him, I'm sorry, will you forgive me? What would be the first thing he would say? Give my money back. Thank you. <laughs> Some things are easy to work out because you can give it back. This, this, I think we can get this resolved pretty quickly. It really wasn't right to take your money. I didn't even warn you it was coming. I shouldn't have used you as an illustration in the sermon. When you didn't know it was coming, here's your money back. My bad, okay? I don't think you'll probably be laying awake about that tonight. Nope. But it gets a lot harder when you take something that can't be given back. When you take someone's life, when you take someone's reputation, when you take someone's future, when you take someone's family, when you, when you take things that can't be given back, that's a way, way, way different thing. Nevertheless, as I'm gonna show you in a moment, we're still commanded to forgive. So um, forgiveness, uh, unforgiveness is basically saying you owe me. You owe me and I'm not going to let it go. Now, Larry, when I had that money and I looked like you didn't know when it was coming back, I clearly owed you then. You have a feeling of, man, you just took something, you owe me. And if I didn't give it back, you would have got to work yourself to a place where you are like, you don't owe me. Now, some of you who run businesses and some things, you understand what it's like to write off bad debt. I got to let that go. We're not going to collect that. I'm not going to spend our time on it. I'm not going to keep on coming in here and cheesing over the guy that got, got us to do all that work and never paid us, right? So sometimes forgiveness is so clear. But other times, like I said, when it involves intangibles, it's a lot different. But if you want to understand it in a lot of words, let's put that definition up again. Forgiveness is the decision to release a person from the obligation that resulted when they injured you. I'm going to let it go. Now, unforgiveness is you owe me. So as we're going through this, I want you to make a mental note because the Holy Spirit can do this for everyone who is hearing this here and everyone who's hearing this in every place that this teaching goes. The Holy Spirit can bring to your mind the faces, the names of people that if they came in here tonight and they sat right down in that chair or in this one right beside you, you'd be like, what? That's nobody you want anywhere near you. They owe you. How can I sit here and act like everything's awesome? You owe me. So just to be really clear, forgiveness is releasing the person. It's mercy is I'm not going to do anything about the fence. Grace is I'm going to try to show some kindness to the offender. But forgiveness is, is that I am going to release the person. You don't owe me anything. That's forgiveness, okay? So uh, let's work on this. Um, common rationalizations for not forgiving. Anybody? So through the years, I've always used the illustration of, of a, uh, like a tumor, right? Which is nothing to laugh about. It's a pretty serious injury. And unforgiveness is a pretty serious injury too. So supposing, and I'm not making fun of any particular body types. Mine's quite round. <laughs> but how many people feel like if I had come in here tonight like this, that would have been, somebody would have been concerned slightly. Something's not right there, right? So would you, have, would you be able to see something's not right with your brother? Absolutely. This is a problem. I don't know what you're talking about, see? 
but everyone can see it, right? You know a bitter person. You know an unforgiving person. You know a person who's holding on to what people did to them. Here's the common uh, rationalizations with the illustration of the tumor. Um, I can't forgive this. It's too big. Hmm. What do you think of that? Okay, but wouldn't it, wouldn't it make more sense? The bigger it is, the more, you, you, I mean, when you really understand that it's the cancer's eating you, you, you'd be like, doctor, put me under, double anesthetic, just don't wake me up till it's gone. First question in recovery, did you get it all? Right? The bigger it is, the more, it doesn't make any sense. But if I'd had a private conversation with you, or you with me, you would find that the hardest forgivenesses are the biggest ones. And they do the most damage too. Here's another common rationalization. Um, time will heal it. How's that going? See, time heals nothing. Time heals nothing. Avoidance, I just won't see them anymore. Yeah, but then when you do see them, right? Dang, if it wasn't for Christmas dinner, I could avoid this entirely, <laughs> right? And then we get through a family event or we get through something at work because she's there, he's there. We don't want to deal with them. What I want is I want the men in our houses and the family members that come here to this study to support them and others that have gathered and you're welcome to. I want us to understand that forgiveness is the pathway to the greatest community and relationships you've ever known in your life before. The bigger it is, the more you should get rid of it. Time will heal, time heals nothing. Oh, here's the third one. Common rationalizations. Um, <laughs> I'll forgive when they say they're sorry. <coughs> I don't know, you know, 22 year old me, 32 year old me, 42 year old me, thought a lot more of that would happen. 62-year-old me would say, if you're waiting for them to come and tell you they're sorry, I got to tell you, I'm not saying it never happens, and I have seen it happen, and it's a wonderful thing when it happens, but it doesn't happen very often. And if your plan for you to be free for the sake of the people that you do love is for time to take care of it, or for them to come and say they're sorry, that's nowhere in the scripture, by the way. I'll say a bit more about that in a second. Or maybe I'll just say it now. The Bible calls for immediate, unilateral, total forgiveness. This is pretty, this is pretty high. So immediate means what? Tell me. Now. 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 Unilateral means what? Everybody. Everybody. Okay. And total means? Everything. Well done, guys. Well done. So it, now everyone everything. That's, that's a high bar. Well, we have three exceptions. Well, those are going to be the ones that are going to be tearing you up. And unforgiveness is like gripping a coal tightly and expecting someone else to get burned. That isn't what happens. So here's the fourth one. Common rationalizations. I can't, this is, I understand this one. I can't forgive if I can't forget. I try to forgive, and then I'm freaking, I'm right back there again. Same stuff. I'm picturing this teacher I had in school, this extended family member who did something unthinkable to me, this, and, and I, I think it's gone, but then it isn't gone, and I find myself caught, how can I forgive if I can't forget? Well, again, we don't talk about this very often. I, I would venture to say there's hardly anyone in this room right now that's had an hour-long discussion with someone else about forgiveness, maybe ever, unless you did it in the context of sobriety and ministry. Other than that, that great movement of helping people live free, most people are not having extensive dialogue about this, and that's why the rationalizations persist, because you never have anybody go, that's dumb, okay? The hurt is too big, I don't think so. Time will heal it, really? Is it, going, is it gone down while I've been talking? Uh, when they say they're sorry, I can't forgive if I can't forget. Well, here's what I would tell you about that. You will never forget until you forgive. 
You'll never, and I'll say more about this probably next week, but let me give this to you really quickly so you understand. Forgiveness happens at a moment in time, at a crisis, and then it happens through a process. The crisis is, I choose to release the person from the obligation that resulted when they injured me. The process is, is I won't bring it up to other people. That's tough. Because unforgiveness wants sympathy. I won't bring it up to other people. I won't bring it up to that person. That's hard too. And then the last one is, I won't bring it up to myself. That's probably the hardest one because everything was going awesome. And then all of a sudden I realized I've been standing in the shower for 40 minutes <laughs> thinking about this again, right? Some of you who have been around here for a while know that I had a, I've always had a great relationship with my dad, but in recent years for reasons, it was very, very difficult. I stood right in this room and I said, I have an appointment this week. I got to take care of something. And I was talking about my dad and I, Drove up to Canada and met with him, and Kathy and I have since had him down here, and I'm glad to be able to tell you, I had my brothers helping me, but I mean, I got that 100% behind me. By the time, how many people were here the night my dad came here right to the study, right? So, I mean, God did an awesome thing there, and it's so interesting, you can't get rid of it, you can't get rid of it, you can't get rid of it, and then you forgive, and you're like, it's gone. It's just gone. All those feelings of animosity and so on, they're gone. Here's the last one. Um, common rationalizations, but if I forgive, they'll do it again. So, oh, you mean you might have to carry two of these, right? So that's not a reason, the fact that they might do it again. Um, and forgiveness, by the way, doesn't require exposing yourself to the same ill treatment. You don't have to let someone do it. That's not what it is, not at all. So forgiveness, again, the decision to release a person from the obligation that resulted when they injured me, we're trying to knock down these rationalizations Five reasons to forgive, that's the first one, probably half the whole message. The rest are gonna come pretty fast now. Because forgiveness ends offense. Where you're offended, you're not cool. No one's into that part of you. Where you're, st I believe me, I'm preaching to myself. Where you're still carrying the fence about X, where you're still carrying that offense, that part of you, everyone's ready, been ready for a while for you to let go of it, right? So that's the second thing, and I just taught it. Forgiveness has no limits, no limits. It calls for immediate, unilateral, total forgiveness. I wanna show you a little parable. It's the last passage we'll have to turn to. So go in the Gospel of Matthew, if you're looking at these verses, and go to Matthew 18. Matthew 18. So again, Matthew 18, 15 says, if your brother sins against you, do you see it there? Go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you've gained your brother. If he does not listen to you, take someone on, along with you that every charge may be established. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile or tax collector, which is basically, you know, a godless person that we can't really affect and we gotta kinda let it go. Again, I say to you, if two or three of you agree about anything, they ask it will be done for them by my Father in heaven, where two or three of you are gathered in my name, I'm in the, among them. So Christians love that verse. There's like, oh, come on, let's put our hands together, you know, where two or three are gathered in my name. And the problem, well, that's nice. I mean, I think that's nice. But the context is forgiveness, forgiveness where two or three people bow in prayer and say, we're getting in a car and we're going over to win our brother. We're asking you, God, to come with us when we go to win this person back. And that's where God says, man, when you're out there putting the family back together, when you're out there putting the brotherhood back together, when you're out there mending fences and building bridges, God's like, I am all about that. And I'm right there with you when that's happening. That's pretty awesome, isn't it? So little bit further in the text so apparently it needed some more teaching just keep with me here I'm in verse 21 is it right then Peter came up to him and said Lord how often will my brother sin against me so look up here he, he knew that he was calling for total immediate unilateral forgiveness so Peter was doing the math on this the Old Testament the the priests taught you got to forgive a person three times 
So Peter thought, I'm going to get an A here. It's like bringing the teacher an apple. How many times should I forgive Jesus? How about seven? How about seven? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 70 times seven. Okay, so what that's not saying is 67, 68, 69, you're finished. That's not what it's saying. The idea is a big number. The, the thing is, is what is 70 times 7? 488, 489, 490, now I'm out of jail. No, it, it's saying stop counting. And then, this is the most amazing little story. Can I just read it to you? Jesus told a parable to make the point clear. Peter wanted to limit forgiveness. Jesus said no limit. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. I'm going to use Bobby and uh, Chuck. Guys, put your stuff down. You guys are in the sermon now. So come on up here and help me. Let's make it. You stay there, Chuck. We're going to make Bobby the criminal. Okay. That's great. And, and, and uh, <laughs> Bobby's, just, Bobby's just very comfortable wearing the black hat. Now, um, so I'm the story guy. So here comes this guy, the king. That's me. I think I'll be the king. That's it. All in course, favor? Of course you will. All okay, great. Thanks. Thanks. All in favor. <laughs> so here's this king. He wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him and who owed him 10,000 talents. Now, that's, that's not like I can juggle. Talents was like a measurement of money. It's not like, oh, watch me with a yo-yo. That's a talent. We're talking about money. He owed him 10,000 talents. One talent was 20 years wages. So if he owed him 10,000 talents, when was that going to get paid? <laughs> never. never. Never and not close to never. It's just like, how, how did you even get to owe Warren Buffett 10 billion? <laughs> like, how does a person even get to that? Like, I don't know, man. It's been crazy. It's just been crazy. So, you owe the, so, so everyone say unpayable. Unpayable. He owes more than he could possibly pay. So that guy was brought to him, to the king, and um, 10,000 talents. And since he could not pay, well, yeah, his master ordered him to be sold. Sell him. Sell him. And his wife, check, not. Nina. Sell his children. Think about yeah. that. Think about that. Yeah. Sell your wife. Sell your children. And all that he had and that payment, which is kind of a joke, right? So if you sold the guy, sold his Wife sold his kids, sold his house, sold his trailer, sold his, you know, bottle cap collection, whatever. Sold it all. How close is it going to come to the uh, 10,000 talents? Nothing, right? Sell, basically, write it off, sell it all. We'll get a little bit. So the servant, the master, I'm not going to make you act this part out, Bobby. But this guy with the unpayable debt fell on his knees, imploring the king. You can say this is your line right here. Starting with have. I can't read nothing. Can't even see it. Have. <laughs> this is your line. Have patience with me and I will pay you everything. <laughs> have patience with me and I will pay you everything. You know what? Just <laughs> So this is what the guy says. Have patience with me and I will pay you everything. Like, I don't mean to be critical, bro, but I think it's how you got into this problem. <laughs> going to pay me everything? 10,000 talents? 10,000 times 20 years wages? Come on. But that's what he said. Just a little patience. Now here's the king. The king in the parable represents the Lord. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him, there's the forgiveness, and forgave him the debt. Now, how does this guy feel? Kind of walking out, just kind of walk back to your chair, but don't go into it. So he's walking back. How happy is he? Come on, let's cheer for him. That's a great thing. That is a great thing that happened today. The problem is, is that when he gets outside, come on over here. The problem is, is that when he gets outside, and I'm just going to help you with your gestures here. Yeah. He gets outside and he sees a guy who owes him like 10 bucks. Oh. It was more than that, though. It was like maybe 10 years wages. Still a lot, right? He sees this guy. He just got f forgiven 10,000. He said, you can shake him a little bit. Some choking is appropriate. Okay. <laughs> All right, now, Freeze, let me give you the rest of the story. Stay right there. No, you have to continue to choke him, so... And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. 
And seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, here's your line, Bobby, pay me what you owe. Go ahead. Pay me what you owe. So his fellow servant, go ahead, Chuck, fell down and pleaded with him. Here's your... Have mercy. <laughs> have mercy and I will pay you everything. And I will pay you everything. Oh. Oh, you know what? Okay, you can both sit down. Now, what would you think is about to happen? Well, you'd think so, right? Because, thank you for saying that. Because he was forgiven an unpayable debt. You were forgiven, I say it, and come on, all together, you were forgiven a and now you're running this guy who owes you still a lot, like, like a year's wages. But it's not small. But I mean, you're not in debt anymore at all. It's kind of staggering. Now watch what happens. He said to him, be patient with me and I'll pay you all. And this is so shocking. The first guy, it says, verse 30, he refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. Come on, everybody, give this to Bobby. <laughs> what a very bad person you are. You're a good example, actually. Bobby's a very, very forgiving person. Now listen, when his fellow servants saw what, he had, what had taken place, they were greatly distressed. And they went, there's always this kid in school, right? You know, went and reported to their master. I, I, I mean, it's what happened, but I, I really have a hard time with those people, right? What is it? Snitches get? Snitches. As our Lord would say. That's right. <laughs> they told the master all that had taken place. Then the master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all of that debt. And... You pleaded with me because you pleaded with me. Should you not also have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in his anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. And there's that line again. So also my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. Say so... We should forgive because the fact of the matter is, is forgiveness ends the offense. Secondly, because forgiveness has no limits. Here's the third thing, and it's right in the text there, because I'm forgiven. In Christ we are forgiven. All of our sins, past, present, and future. It's shocking. While most people are out there foolishly trying to impress God with their good works, God says, I... I it's not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us. And Jesus paid a debt for our sin. He said, you don't know. You don't know. And so the basic line requirement is, is if that forgiveness of God in Christ has really impacted your life, the first place that shows up is, is in how you forgive other people. Or make a note of it this way. Forgiven people become forgiving people. Okay? If you know that you are, say it, forgiving. then without a doubt you're going to become forgiving. forgiving people become forgiving people. That's the path that we're all supposed to be on. Now that's not to say you can't, you know, fall off the horse a little bit, but you need to get back on. And this is a series on freedom. How many people are drinking themselves into numbness because of pain that they haven't forgiven? How many people are living in or returning to their addiction because there's a certain perverse pleasure in going over the ways that I've been wronged? And then this is the key of it all in the passage I just taught. Because I'm forgiven, and then fourthly, because unforgiveness destroys me. The guy who, forgot, who refused to forgive the other guy, he's the one that ended up, all the debt was put back on him, all the weight was back on his shoulders. All God's asking is, if you've been forgiven and received the forgiveness that's in Christ, then just forgive people. Now again, that doesn't mean you say what they did is okay. That doesn't mean that you let them close enough to do it again. Clear? Everyone say clear. clear. It just means that you release them from that. You don't owe me anymore. 
I don't want to be in a relationship with you, but you don't owe me. And you know, um, you get to choose who you're in a relationship with. You don't have to put yourself in a, in a terrible position. And but unforgiveness destroys me, and that guy clearly got destroyed. Nothing will cut a swath of destruction in your life. It's like a tornado across a Kansas wheat field. I'm telling you, unforgiveness mows everything down. And uh, I'm working on some pretty significant um, forgivenesses myself. So I can tell you that um, it, isn't, it isn't easy. And uh, so let me read them to you. Um, because forgiveness um, ends the offense, because forgiveness has no limits, because I am forgiven, because unforgiveness destroys, I, I left that part out, my bad, destroys other people. You heard how many people in that story got hammered? Unforgiveness hurts other people, and then unforgiveness destroys me. Make a note of this, I taught this for many years, and candidly, I've been quite disillusioned with this point. Um, but I'm trusting the Lord about it. I'm working on some very significant forgivenesses myself and have been for some time, but I'm seeing some definite headway. And see, what happens is, is you're like, okay, I'm going to forgive them. That's the crisis. Now, I'm not going to bring it up to them. I'm not going to bring it up to other people. I'm not going to bring it up to myself. And when you fail, because you know, it's going to be a trial and error thing, when you fail in the process, you've got to go back to the crisis and say, okay, well, I'm the problem because I've been forgiven. I said I would forgive, but here I'm not forgiving. And you just got to go crisis process, crisis process, and keep on working about that. I think probably all of us can think of things that at one time were really hurtful, but now they're like nothing. It's just like, can't even touch me anymore. And we got to get everything, you know, off that list.